Hey friend, it's season four of the Dr. Lee Warren podcast. I've got Philip Yancey, New York Times bestselling writer, Philip Yancey on the show today to talk about his amazing new memoir, Where the Light Fell. This is the YouTube channel for the Dr. Lee Warren podcast. We're excited to have you with us today. We've got Philip Yancey. It's an amazing conversation. Buckle up. It's a great one. Where the Light Fell by Philip Yancey. Let's get after it. Friend. Hey friend, we're back and I'm so excited today. I've got my my dear friend and mentor, I would call him, uh, Philip Yancey here to talk about his new memoir, Where the Light Fell. Hey Philip, welcome to the show. Thank you, Lee. It's good to be back. It's good to see your face, my brother. And uh, how are things going out there in Colorado? Well, it's cold, but uh, that's that's expected in January in Colorado and we know how to handle it. We go down mountains and up mountains and ski across lakes and skate and do all that stuff. So winter's winter's a wonderland here. That's right. And you're a big outdoor guy. You've climbed, you and your wife both have climbed all 54 of the 14,000 foot mountains, right? We have. It took us about 13 years. We did three or four a summer and finally got them all done. Wow. without killing ourselves. <laughs> That's right. And there's a few in Col- in uh, California too. Did you climb those as well? Did not. Those California mountains, they're, California can have them. We've got plenty of our own. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you, do. you do have a lot. <laughs> Well, that's great. I know you've been quite an adventurous outdoorsman your whole life. And so I was, I was really thrilled um, when you told me a couple of years ago now that you were writing a memoir Um, and, you know, I've read all of your books and you've been, uh, it's no secret. I've been kind of a super fan of of your work and you've been so kind to me over the years, but what, what led you to the notion of, of writing a memoir? What, what, what brought that out in you? I've been planning this for, my goodness, at least 30 years. And I wanted to capture the subculture first, Lee. I had read great books about fundamentalist Mormons, like Educated by Tara Westover, and uh, Chaim Potok captures Orthodox Judaism. Uh, Frank McCourt, Angela's Ashes, captures Irish Catholics. And I... I realized that I was gifted, I guess you could say, I was put in the midst of extreme fundamentalism at an unusual time in the South, just as the civil rights movement was getting underway. I grew up in a, in the turmoil of the 1960s, and I keep hearing mm-hmm. about current days, people saying the United States has never been so divided since the Civil War. Well, did you live in the 1960s? Yeah, uh, when that's right. You know, there were a thousand bombings a year by domestic terrorists when there were masses of marching in the streets and a civil rights movement with people being killed. And and so I think we have some things to learn from history. But uh, more than that, I was also in a pretty extreme form of fundamentalist faith in the South. We were mm-hmm. on the wrong side of most every issue that's important. Yeah. And these days... There are a lot of people who are experiencing the church as a negative thing and fleeing it. They, they don't want to necessarily run away from God or just dismiss that altogether, but they, right. they don't find what answers that they're looking for in the church. And um, as I looked at, at my life, I realized I've got some things to explore for myself first, and they may be of help to other people who are finding themselves in that reconstructing mode, you know, first yep. you hear a lot about deconstructing faith, yep. but what about reconstructing faith? What can we learn? I, I like the trilogy that Richard Rohr talks about. He talks about, we, we live, we grow up with order, usually determined by the people around us, the, yep. the adults, the pastor, the parents, whatever. And then we go through a period of disorder where we aren't sure we can swallow everything we are told. And then we go through that final period of reorder. And that's the hard part to create something new. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of the, uh, the intellectual reason for it, but frankly, it it was just my life. I wanted to explore it and put it together and, and find out uh, who I, who I am now and what were the various forces that led me to the, to the place where I am now. Yeah. You know, it's interesting when we talk about things like deconstruction, if you, if you get on Twitter and get into the, the SBC and all the things about church abuse and all these things that people are talking about, and there's, mm. there's a hashtag deconstructing and, and, and the first glance at that, it seems like people are, are walking away from their faith. 
but as you really look at it, it's, it's really what you're describing of people kind of breaking down what they've been taught versus how it lines up with scripture and how to put it back together in a way that makes sense. And I think that's what we're supposed to do, right? Paul says, work out your own salvation. And that's sort of that process. Yes. And I would encourage parents. I know you have a younger audience, but parents are often concerned about where their kids are when they're in the middle of that disorder phase. And I would just say, yeah. By that time, it's probably too late. You've already, <laughs> you've already contributed what you can. So just right. step back, give them some space and, and pray and love. I mean, that's about the best thing you can do. And yeah. often when young couples have children of their own, then they start thinking, well, what am I going to impart to my kids? How, how am I going to present the world to them? The, how they should be, behave, why we're put here in the first place? And they do have to come up with a kind of reconstructing that, that makes sense for the next generation. Yeah, I love it. You know, so I'm not, you know, I'm not a lifetime um, professional writer. I've come to writing late, uh, later in my life, and you had a lot to do with that. But I, I, I have to tell you that from my perspective, um, you just did a masterful job. It almost feels like somebody who writes fiction. This is a, a narrative nonfiction approach to your memoir. Um, as a storyteller, but you have just a, a master's grasp on tone and point of view and, and uh, tense. And, and I just, I love how you weaved in and out of present and past tense. And you just did a really nice job on the craft side. I just, I just want to say that going up front. Hmm. Well, thank you, Lee. I'm glad you noticed that. I, I was nervous. I had never written a memoir. Uh, in fact, all my books are pretty much the same style. They're yeah. what I call, um, personal pilgrimage essays, <laughs> basically. Yeah. I take a look at, uh, at Jesus or prayer or grace or the Old Testament. And I usually start out kind of in the margins, a little skeptical, sifting through what I was taught growing up, and then a reaction period. And then I try to come to terms with how I see them now. So that's, that's the pattern in all my books. And yeah. in earlier drafts, frankly, <laughs> Parts of it sounded like an essay, and I, and I had some wise editors who kept saying, "You can't do this. Just tell the story. Tell the story." And and I had read a lot of memoirs just to try to figure out how the thing worked. And I learned uh, dialogue is important, creating scenes is important, and and it was it was a great exercise for me to go back and not just think, "Don't give the summary story." Paint the picture. Tell me what was yeah. going on. What sounds were in the background? What did you actually see? Can you remember the the words that were used? And that is, those are the techniques of fiction. They're what keeping us. They're what keep us for turning the page. That's right. And um, I learned a lot about the genre, and also have to thank the editors who got me to chop down 240,000 words down to about 99,000. So <laughs> there's a lot it left on so the cutting much. room floor and it probably it belongs so there. Much. And they said, this is great, but it's twice as long as it should be. You got to cut half That's of it. That's right. It kills you. I want to read you. Um, I want to read us just one little paragraph that you wrote. And I don't want to give away too much of your story. It's people who haven't read it, friend, you, you really have to read this book, but um Set this story up for us, Philip, where you started really in the, in chapter one, sort of almost a preface uh, to the book, and, and you finished it by saying, I don't know what to think. I know only that I have been misled. The secret is out now, and I determined to investigate and write it down someday as truthfully as I can. That's a perfect setup. For, so you're 40 years ago, 50 years ago, 60 years ago. You experience something with your mom and your dad and your family, and you tell yourself then, someday I got to tell this story. So tell us right. a little bit of that. Right. So many families have these secrets that come out in various ways, and, yeah. and I had one. It was a huge secret. I lost my father. I was a year old, and I knew that he died of polio. That's about all I knew. I, of course, at one year old, I had no conscious memory yeah. of him at all. And he was always portrayed as this kind of mythic figure. He had been uh, a wild, crazy kid doing wild, crazy things, and yeah. then ended up in the Navy right at the end of World War II. He was miserable. He wanted to get out. He couldn't get out and happened to attend a church service. Uh, became a Christian in the meantime. He, he, he was yeah. so 
desolate and and depressed that he went to this specific garden mission in Chicago, which is a famous mission there. There was a radio program called Unshackled. In fact, it's still going on that tells stories of yeah. people. And they did an Unshackled program on him because they were used to mostly dealing with drunks and alcoholics. And here yeah. was a sharp young uh, sailor guy, but he wandered in and became a Christian. He just had nowhere else to turn. He ended up going home with a family at a church and met my the woman who became my mother, his wife. And they were only married for four years. They had two children. My brother was two years older and then I was one year old. And then he got sick. They were planning to be missionaries in Africa. Got sick, was put in an iron lung with polio and died. And I knew that part of it, but it wasn't until I was 18 years old, I was in college by then. And my girlfriend who became my wife went with me to my grandparents' house so that would be my father's parents. And she wanted to know, tell me about the Yanceys. Uh, don't know much about your family. Tell me. And we brought out an old scrapbook. And while I was flipping through the scrapbook, this yellowed newspaper clipping fell out and I picked it up and it was an article about my father and mother. I'd never seen this before. Here we were in the newspaper. It's a big deal. And they showed him he's lying in bed. He's unable to move still, she's feeding him. And I recognize her, she, here she is in her 20s herself, but I could tell right away, that's my mother. And the article was this triumph of faith that he had been in the iron lung at a charity hospital for about two and a half months. And then he was removed because up to 5,000 people were praying for him. They were gonna support him on the mission field in Africa. And they became convinced that he would be healed. Why would God possibly take someone with such potential and fervor? Mm -hmm. So surely God wants him healed. And against medical advice, you know that phrase very well, I'm surely. Yep. The article specifies against medical advice. They, they checked him out of the charity hospital and moved him to a clinic, that, which really had no way to treat polio patients. And, the, and when the article was written, he was showing possibly some signs of of a little bit of recovery. Maybe he had some feeling in his right toe. Maybe he thought he could move a little bit. But I looked at the at the date of the newspaper and it was nine days before he died. Mm. And here was this huge event in my life that took place and I, I had no idea about it because what happened was when he died, my mother was so crushed by that and, and I'm sure she felt some guilt and some responsibility because these people, you know, against medical advice, took a leap of faith. Yeah. And so she went on to make this solemn vow to give us, my brother and me, to God to fulfill his place. And that, uh, on the one hand, sounds kind of noble and spiritual, but the way it worked out, it was almost like a witch's curse. Yeah, especially for my brother. And the, the book tells the story of how that worked out in our family. We went very different directions, my brother and I. But it, it really traced our entire life in, in a lot of ways was defined by that mistake. It was a theological mistake. They took on the prerogative of that they didn't have. It, it's God's yeah. choice to decide who God will heal, heal and, and or not. That's right. And they decided for sure that this was God's will. That, that guaranteed that we would be growing up in poverty because she really had no way to make a living. She was unprepared for that, never remarried. That was part of the vow, I'll not remarry. I'll make sure these boys are raised to fulfill their father's place. Mm -hmm. And then um, we didn't, you know. I tell her, wait a minute, my books are in Africa, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That, that, that doesn't count, I guess. And my brother went a very different direction and uh, the two of them only actually only since the book has been written have had any contact at all. They had not heard wow. each other's voice for 51 years wow. until I finally got them on, on a telephone conversation. Wow. So th that was the family secret that worked its poison behind the scenes. I didn't even know the truth until I was 18. And yet when I learned it, everything clicked into place. I realized her fervor, how, rigid she was and how 
how guilt ridden and how uh, just bereft our family was. And the story behind that, I wrote a book called Disappointment with God. Yeah. Uh, now, my mother would say there's no such thing as disappointment with God. But I think she probably at one level was not only disappointed, was probably furious at God, felt betrayed. Mm -hmm. Here they were going to serve God. And look what he did. He, he took them and, and destroyed a life. Mm. Yeah, that's, it, you know, it, it, it's so powerful how you can look back over all those years and sort of and sort of tie together all the different ways that those things affected your life and your brother's life. And, and really, if you think about it, millions of people who have read your work have been affected by those, those things that you went through. Um, and it, it's kind of amazing to me um, that you were able to tie all those threads together in such a uh, vulnerable way. Um, do you feel like it changed you, Philip, to go, did it, did it, change your perspective on your mom or on any of those things to go back and, and look at all that through these lenses of, you know, from her lens and your brother's lens and your lens, did it, did it change anything inside of you? Or yes, it anything? did. Um, yeah, I think healing is the right word. There was a therapeutic aspect. I know my wife was nervous. I would disappear out into the mountains and she would know that I was going to write about a, a difficult time. And she kept saying, are you okay? Are you okay? And I'd come back. Yeah, yeah I'm okay. I, I stitched it together. I found some way to, to fit it together. And, and it taught me about myself. It, it, that's what therapy does really self understanding. Right. And, and you hear fiction writers talk about the, the sympathy they have for their characters. And I never really understood that. It, but I, I had sympathy for all the characters that I dealt with one by one, because um, if you track back their story, you can see the threads that le led them to become the person that they were, including the negative parts. And I have a lot more sympathy for my mother, just exploring her background, interviewing some of her living r relatives about all that she went through and, and just putting myself in the place of, of this woman who trusted her entire future with this dashing young man yeah. moved from Philadelphia to Atlanta, a very different culture back in those days. And then, and then was so excited to serve God and then to have it ripped away from her so that she could, she had never written a check. She had never driven a car. She was just ill-equipped to deal with life. And she stuck with these two boys and, and parents know what it's like to have a three-year-old and a one-year-old, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I came away with a lot of sympathy for her. And there's a saying, I'm not going to get this quite right, but just there's a saying, it's a good thing to keep in mind that almost every person you meet will be carrying a cross that they can hardly bear. Mm. And that's a good thing mm. to remember. You know, we tend to put on a nice face. Are you, oh, I'm fine. How are you? And actually, we all carry these wounds. We carry unfulfilled dreams. And, and man, she had one to the extreme. Yeah. And uh, passed it on in, in, in negative ways, really, to my brother and me. Yeah. I mean, you know, you did a really good job of, I, I've read several of the books that you mentioned, including another one you didn't mention, but Hillbilly Elegy is mm, another one of these right. memoirs that, that covers where we came from and how we ended up where we are. And, and one of the dangers I think in, in writing a story like that is that it can become a little bit self-serving or sure. um, almost can get to the place of look how far I've come despite all that I've been through and all these terrible things, you know, and you, and you didn't get to that. Um, you could have, if you'd been bitter, but you, you, you truly told the story in a way that shows God's hand in your life and in the way that he brought you through all those things to serve him uh, in a really beautiful way. And I, I think you really threaded that needle just right. Hmm. You know, Lee, um, you're a doctor, you can identify with this, but over the years I've written a lot about pain and have interviewed a lot of people who've gone through yeah. hard times and I came away with kind of a phrase that's almost a mantra to me, and that is that pain redeemed impresses me more than pain removed. Yep. And 
when when some something difficult, some pain, suffering happens, our natural response is to want to get rid of it. And and we pray, as the people did around my father. Oh, this is a terrible thing. So God heal him. You know, make make it possible that the polio virus disappears from his from his body. And that did not happen. And when we when we take into ourselves the prerogative that is God's alone, you can see the consequences there. But then I look back at the people I interviewed, including one of my very first assignments when I was just a journalist wet behind my ears was to interview this Olympic athlete who had broken her neck diving into Chesapeake mm. Bay, Johnny Erickson Tata, who became renowned in the Christian world. And I look at what she's been through, uh, quadriplegia. She had COVID recently. She had a bout with cancer, maybe two bouts with cancer. And yet, through it all, she's redeemed that pain. It didn't go away. It wasn't removed. But she's taken what most people would consider a curse and turned it into a blessing. She became a kind of a prophet to the church yep. about how to treat the disabled. And, and she's affected disabled people all over the world, bringing the most practical form of good news, wheelchairs and crutches and summer camps and things like that. Yep. And I, I think that's the promise that we have. I, I do believe occasionally miracles happen, but you know, you wrote a book. <laughs> I've seen the end of you, glioblastoma. They're really, really rare. Yep. And most of the time when somebody comes in your office, you, you know what the end is going to be. That, that was the point of that book. Yep. But as you also say in that book, the people who go through those things, bad as they are, somehow they can be redeemed for good. They can be useful That's right. uh, for those of us around them, for the family, and, and often for the patient himself or herself. That's right. So that's, uh, that's what I took away. Um, looking back at my own life, I, at, at the end, I really didn't regret anything that's happened. You know, when I read reviews, people talk about, oh, the abuse you endured and hard times and stuff. And I, I didn't think of it at the time. <laughs> you know, it was just growing up. It's just the right. way life was. And I don't think of it that way now. I just think, we all are are given a, a, a set of qualities. Some we have nothing to do with, you know, how we look, how smart we are, things like that. Right. And then some that we do have some control over. And um, the promise that we have, that great verse, chapter really in Romans 8, as Paul describes it, is that working with you, God can work good out of anything that happens. Yep. There's that phrase from Dallas Willard. He says, for the Christian nothing irredeemable can happen to you. Not right. nothing bad can happen. Bad things happen. You know that. You make your living <laughs> about bad things. But um, they can be redeemed. That's a promise we have. And that's why yeah. the common, most common symbol for the faith that we believe in is a cross, an executioner symbol. That's right. Because God found a way to redeem even that, the worst thing that could possibly happen, into the best thing that could possibly happen, a day we call Good Friday. That's right. So what do you think if you had to if you had to do the elevator pitch for this book like what what do you want the person who's listening to this podcast right now what do you want them to get from your story Philip? Again and again I've had conversations with people say on an airplane or sitting in a waiting room and they'll ask me what do you do I'm a writer what do you write I write uh, books about faith, yeah. questions about my faith, and mention a few titles. And and often they'll say, oh, I, I used to be one of those. I used to be a believer, but I just couldn't put up with it anymore. Oh, really? Tell me your story. Yeah. And they tell me a story about, uh, usually about the church, about uh, how weird their church was, or how they treated science, or how they treated gay people or divorced people, you know. <laughs> And I say, so you, yeah. you, you gave up on, on faith, really, because of the church. Yeah, I did. And I say, well, actually, the church is a lot worse, can be a lot worse than what you described. Let me tell you my story. <laughs> and, and I'll tell him a few stories. And he said, wait a minute, I thought you were a Christian writer. I said, well, I am. But that would be a bad trade to give up the opportunity to have a relationship with the God of the universe, the God who created you just because of the way some old lady treated you 30 years ago at church. 
That's right. That's been a trade. And I and what I'd I'd like to reach. I had a nephew who sent me um, a saying that he found under a bottle cap. This particular juice company uh, would put th- little slogans, kind of like a Chinese fortune cookie, under the bottle cap. And and this bottle cap said, "An idea cannot be held responsible for the people who believe it." That's right. And and what I hear that saying is, "Don't blame God for the church. It's it's not God's fault." You know. <laughs> And, and yeah, we've made a mess of it. I mean, look at the people around my father. They, they made a, tr- a fatal mistake, but it, yeah. they were well-intentioned. They didn't do it because they hated him. They loved him and they wanted him to be well. Yeah. But for the best of intentions, they made a tragic mistake. And I, I guess I'd like to reach that group of people, people who have given up on God for the wrong reasons. It God gives us the freedom to reject him. Yep. When when I'm at universities, sometimes I'll tell people, I, I challenge you to find a single argument against God by the great atheists that's not already included in the Bible, in Psalms and Jeremiah, Lamentations, Job, Ecclesiastes. Yeah. God not only understands our doubts, he actually gives us the words to use <laughs> in, in doubting God which is an, right. an amazing fact about God, just the way he can take it. But um, if you're going to make that leap, if you're going to turn your back on the God who created you, just do it for a good reason. Don't do it for a bad reason. And I think growing up in a lousy church is a bad reason to give that up. That's right. That's right. Or family, even if you have family trouble, like, it's it, it's better to press in and let God minister to you and heal you and carry you through those things. And, you know, I don't know, the listener, we've talked about this the other couple of times you've been on the show, but um, if you don't know about Philip, you know, in addition to all the important books that he's written, um, he he's kind of become this person that people call when something terrible happens. Like you, you got the call at Sandy hook and you got the call at Virginia tech at the shooting. And, and for some reason people call you when they need a calm voice in the, in the chaos, as you've said, like, how, how does it come about that somebody raised like you did with all that trouble and all that turmoil doesn't turn out to be a bitter person who throws his faith away, but turns out to be this person who can say, Hey guys, it's going to be okay. Let's, let's get together and talk about how God can get us through this. That that's, that's a lesson right there. Hmm. Yeah. When I, about the time I finished this book, I realized not knowing it, I had written a prequel to all my other books. As I mentioned, all of them are pretty yes. much the same. They're books exploring questions of faith in an essay in personal essay format. But this was very different. And yet at the end, I realized why I write about the things I do, not not what I believe, but why I keep exploring the same things. And I concluded that no matter where I start, I usually end up writing about either suffering or grace. Suffering because I grew up with a lot of it and explored pain as a way to come to terms with it as as kids often do in a in a turmoil environment yeah and then grace because uh to answer your question god was the answer to that god uh reached out to me the name of the book is where the light fell and Mm -hmm. that comes from a quote by saint augustine who said i couldn't look at the sun directly but i could look on where the light fell and i thought about that and that was my story i had been completely scorched by the sun i had, mm-hmm. i lived up to sit in a totally religion saturated environment and it was a harsh uh, hellfire and damnation sin filled discussion in in church every sunday we were yelled at for being these terrible sinners who were on the verge of going to hell and and so i came away with this image of god as this bully who took delight in torturing people. And the light fell for me as I spell out in three different places. One was the beauties of nature. I I was kind of a naturalist growing up. Mm -hmm. I was my solace to go out into the woods and explore. Beauties of classical music. You understand that. You're a musician yourself, Lee. And then romantic love. And those things softened me. And I I realized that, that I had been given a wrong picture of God. 
the god responsible for a universe that included such goodness, the dona bona, the good gifts, as Augustine said, could not be that bully that I came away with. And, and so I was ready, but I didn't know how to meet God because I'd done it so many times and I couldn't tell the difference between the real times and the fake times. They all, they all merged. But God gave me, uh, I guess I call it a revelation. It was an epiphany, a, a revelation of God's own self that exposed me for who I was. Mm. And it changed everything from that moment on. So the reason I write about grace is because God showed me a lot of grace, uh, almost like God looked at me and said, okay, Philip has seen the worst that the church has to offer. Let me show him some of the best. <laughs> mm, that's beautiful. And, and as a journalist, uh, I quickly became acquainted with Dr. Paul Brand. We wrote three books yeah. together. He became a surrogate father for me, really, as an adult, where I could take all my struggles, all my questions to him. And when you reach, when you meet someone up close who truly was transformed by following Jesus, it gives you a kind of confidence that there's something real there that you can't get in any other way. Yeah. And he became that for me. And I had seen plenty of false people, but it, take, it only took one really authentic person uh, to convince me otherwise. Wow. That's beautiful. Well, your, your book, you know, like you said earlier, covers a lot of ground, not just your family story, but the what it was like to grow up in the, in the deep South. And it touches on race and it touches on church and fundamentalism and, and on some good people that came along in your life and, and, uh, and on love. And it's just a, it's a beautiful story. It, it serves um, your career very well. I think to give us insight into how you came to write these books. And um, I, I, I read one little piece at the start and I think there's one little piece at the very end. I'll get your comment on that. You, that you said it just a beautiful sentence. Uh, it turns out to be the last sentence. Um, Above all else, grace is a gift, one I cannot stop writing about until my story ends. <laughs> well, thank you for that. And I had no idea when I wrote that, Lee, but people who read the book will, will find that it ends with a lot of loose ends in my family. My mother and yeah. brother were not speaking, and there was just no sign of any movement there. After I turned in the book, I really should call it back and, and write one more chapter because there's been some remarkable movement between them and people write me and say, Oh, I, I'm praying for your family. And I write back and say, well, thank you. And your prayers are being answered even as we speak here, That's because uh, the, the story of grace kept going even after I wrote that last sentence. Oh, well, there'll be a 10 year anniversary version. That'll there come you go. Out you can tell that story. <laughs> That's so beautiful. You know, I, I, I neglected to, um, to say at the start, you know, that I, I always start these episodes with you and we always pray together and, and all of that, but it feels like a perfect time to uh, hear at the end that we just pray for it. Cause I, I, I can tell you the people listening to this, um, like your readers, my readers circle around hard things that have happened. Um, you know, the, the people that are, that have experienced great loss are the people that are kind of drawn to what I talk about and write about. And, and so I think it's a great, um, time if you would pray for us that that your words and these words will be received and that they'll help people to see that um, no matter what they're going through that all is not lost that your story can turn out like phillips did like his mom and his brother reconnecting and, and, and there's still some potential for beauty as long as uh as long as you were breathing right doom sparrow sparrow as long while i breathe i hope so would you pray for us phil sure Gracious God, I can't even imagine the family situations represented by people listening to us right now. I can't imagine the pain that those who have special needs child, children, those who are putting parents in a facility, a memory care facility, those who are struggling with COVID or the death of someone who had COVID and cancers and many other things. I can't imagine that. Just It's a swirl. But I pray, I pray that the church would indeed be the body of Christ. We're told to represent the Father of compassion, the God of all comfort. And it took me a long time, but I came to get to know you, God, as the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. And I pray that 
the words that I wrote might be just one of many examples of hope of how you can take pain and redeem it. You can, you're the great recycler. You take things that we want to throw away, we want to get rid of and somehow, somehow make something worth recycling out of them. And so I pray for those who are listening that they not give up, that they not sever a potential relationship with you because of the church. The church has its own dysfunction. We all know that. Family does, church does. And I pray that this would be a gift for people who are just trying to stay afloat because there are a lot of people like that. Thank you for Lee and what he does in a very practical way every day in dealing with people who are terrified and who need that gentle care of a physician. May we see you as the great physician who wills the best for us and accepts us and wants to restore us to health. Thank you that the light keeps falling in, in many ways. And we are your children. We're children who are, are graced by you by living in this beautiful world. And also believing that no matter what happens, somehow you can reclaim good out of it. Mm-hmm. In your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Philip. Friend, it's Philip Yancey, Where the Light Fell. It's a memoir. It's beautiful. It's important. Um, and you've heard me say it a million times. And, and Philip, I know you always you always deflect when I say this, but like, I literally owe my career as a writer to you. Like, like you, <laughs> you, you, you gave me that gift and it's led to, look at all that, the Christian Book Award and all this stuff, and the Italian <laughs> translation. So you've, you've done it. You've done such a grace in my life and I'm just grateful. And uh, Lisa and I want to give away four copies of Where the Light Fell. Friend, the first four listeners that write in to Lee at DrLeeWarren.com, tell me your name and address and whether you would prefer the hardcover or audio version and we'll send you or the digital version lisa and i will send you as a gift uh, for listening uh four copies of where the light fell by philip yancey and i would highly encourage you to go read the jesus i never knew and what's so amazing about grace those are the two books that deconstructed and reconstructed my faith on a personal level and set me on the path that i'm on today and um nobody uh, without hyperbole philip no individual human has been as important to my faith walk as you have and I just, I can't ever tell you how grateful I am. Well, you scare me when you talk about uh, being responsible for your writing career. I think about all those people who could have abused you as a brain surgeon. And I hope <laughs> I hope you didn't leave any of them on the table. To... <laughs> no, I still got them. I write okay. at extreme hours of the morning, but I still got the brain surgery. So thank you uh, for everything, as always, for your time. And uh, any parting words for us today, Philip? Well, I'm excited to read your book. Maybe we should switch microphones here in a few months because uh, I know you've got a new book under wraps and underway, yeah. and uh, I'd love to interview you about that sometime. Oh, I'd love it. We'll make it happen. Philip okay. Yancey, thank you so much. God bless you, my friend, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Lee. Hey, thanks for listening. Go to the website, wleewarnmd.com, for more information about my letter, this show, my books, and more. Don't forget, wleewarnmd.com slash prayer for the prayer wall of people praying with and for each other all over the world. If you need help, if you need somebody praying for you, or if you need a community to be involved in, wleewarnmd.com slash prayer is the place to go. It's really become an amazing place to pray first, pray first, pray first, wleewarnmd.com slash prayer. If you're not getting the newsletter, you need to be connected to this amazing community, wleewarnmd.com slash newsletter for more about that. The theme music for the show is Water Into Wine by Tommy Walker, graciously provided for free by Tommy and the good people who are changing the world over at Tommy Walker Ministries. Get the music for free and consider supporting Tommy's great work at www.tommywalkerministries.org. That's tommywalkerministries.org. Remember, friend, you can't change change your life until you change your mind. You have to start today. I'm Dr. Lee Warren. I'll talk to you soon. God bless you and have a great day.